Oh, how do we start it? I don't even know. Well, we're smiling and laughing, so just go. <laughs> it's like when they come back from a commercial break. That's and exactly like, what it is, because we're having our themes. Wait, on. you're this way? Let's look at each other. <laughs> no, you're looking the wrong way. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Broken Art Podcast, our first episode. My name is Adam. <laughs> I'm Callie. This is the first episode of the Broken Art Podcast. Kelly, how are you feeling? I'm feeling good. For once, I'm feeling prepared, probably because I actually have time to work on stuff now. So I, I'm feeling pretty good. You know, as an actress, you probably shouldn't like say that this is the first time you're feeling prepared for something. Oh, we all know it. We're no all one, cramming. No, We're all. At, like, I feel like in order to be an actor, it's like a prerequisite that you have to like be a procrastinator as well. There is an appropriate amount of stress that we all have to go through to be successful. Yes. And it you all starts with cramming. <laughs> yeah. You can't spell success without S, which is in stress. It's half the word. So. It's half the word. <laughs> there you go. That's so great. Callie, how long have we known each other? Oh, since babies. Since we're babies. We didn't quite come out of the womb together. We did but... not. We were this close. Yeah. <laughs> no, we we met at uh, a summer theater program mm. in our hometown where we both grew up. Yeah. Um, and that was, gosh, a budding, budding friendship ever since. I had hair back then. You did. You really I... did. And then it grew more when I got to college. And then I started balding and then I shaved everything off. Right. And so now you're just living your 40 year old man within a. I've been 20. mistaken yeah. for a college professor three times this year. Yeah, I I'm sure you have. And they come up to me and they're like, where do you, so like, where do you teach in the department? Yeah. And I'm like, then I think about it for a second. I like, I could lie to this freshman and tell them that I'm the Dean of Music, or I can tell the truth. So remember like five years ago and there was this meme format and I was like, hey, what are you gonna be doing five years from now? And the guy was like, I don't know, I don't have 2020 vision and we're all laughing about it, right? And now we're in 2020 and we still don't have 2020 vision. <laughs> like we don't know what's going on. Man, right? do you remember like celebrating New Year's Eve this past New Year's. Oh my God. And just how excited and blissfully ignorant and just it's a new decade. Yeah. I mean, these are for like, these are our working years now. Like this is time yes. that we can get something done. This is a huge revelation. Mm -hmm. And then the world went kaput. Well, it's, yeah, it's just like, oh my gosh. And you like, you hear about like New Year's, I'm with a bunch of my friends and I think I was driving to my friend's place for a new year's gathering. And I was listening to NPR cause I'm 50 years old. And on it was like, Oh yeah, there's this uh, virus in Wuhan, China. And I was like, Oh gosh, that's, that's crazy. Click off, you know, listen to Katy Perry for a couple more minutes, you know, before I go inside and then not, but two and a half, three months later, you know, we have quarantine, um, we have social distancing. We have all these different things. So we're just kind of wondering, like, what is the state of the arts right now? Mm -hmm. What are we doing as musicians, as actors, as performers during this pandemic? So first up, do you remember where you were when the shutdown first happened? Yeah. Um so I actually had a friend from college visiting me here in the city. We had tickets to go see the um, the uh, matinee of Moulin Rouge. Oh, and we're walking, no. you know, we're walking to the theater. And as soon as we get there, we see people passing out letters saying, 
today's performance is canceled due to the COVID like uh, scare and everything that's happening. Oh wow. Um, yeah, and like, oh gosh. So, so we. So you were to, like on your way to something. It we, was like we got like the first, the first like hit that was like we're canceling the show, you know. And then we went over to a bakery and like got donuts because we were so bummed. Right. And then within 25 minutes, the announcement that all of Broadway was going to be shut down. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. You're... What? Do you remember where you were? Um. Yeah, actually, I was. I was in our hometown because I was. I just got done doing some preparatory work for my summer job. And it was the day before I was going to leave to go um, back to college. And I was like, all right, school starts tomorrow. My last semester mm -hmm. of college, the, my, the last month and a half. And then I'm with a couple of my friends um, the night before I leave and we're watching the news. And I get an email from, I get an email from the dean of my college saying, we're going to extend spring break for another couple, another couple days. So I'm like, Oh, great. More spring break or whatever. And then not, but like five or six days later, it's like the rest of the semester is going to be online. And it was like, you, I think I speak for a lot of people out there. It was like, you don't think about like having these last experiences like taken away from you. I think of all of my students who are seniors in high school right now. Mm -hmm. Like that was one of the first things I thought about. I was like, oh my gosh, goodbye prom, goodbye senior night, goodbye volunteering for in the neighborhood before you graduate, goodbye experiencing all of these um, things with your classmates and teachers. Um, and at first, I think I was kind of in denial about it. I was like, oh, we're going to be fine. They're going to change their mind. And then they didn't. No, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, what the heck? What's going on? Um, and so, like, when you're talking about like, what did I lose? Mm -hmm. Like, I lost just a lot of last experiences with a lot of my friends because um, I stayed in college for an extended amount of time, um, and so I had a lot of friends who were my age and older who graduated. But then I made a lot of other friends who were younger than me that hadn't graduated. Um, so I was really holding on to those experiences. Like we had a concert like a couple days um, the week before spring break happened. And I didn't think that that was going to be my last college choir concert. Ever. You know? Ever, you know? And you yeah. know, it's like, I'm so thankful it was like a good concert and a great year. And we had some great rep and I was, I was just so thankful to be a part of it. Um, but yeah, that kind of like... I was very lucky that I ended on a high note um, yeah. for that as well. And and uh, you had some really nice opportunity, well, not opportunities, but some nice recognitions go, being thrown your way because uh, your your education started doing these online award, you know, where they would yeah. announce the awards online. And you got a couple of them. I was crying for three days straight. I was crying for three days straight. Um, I, I've, I've just been so fortunate to work with so many just stellar friends, people that I'm so lucky to call friends and being in the community that I am. I'm able to work with the youth choir. I've been able to music direct some shows, conduct some operas. And through that, I just got some unforeseen recognition and I cried because it was very over, <laughs> it was very overwhelming to get from yeah. all of these people and from different places. Um, and then in that three day time span, there was a piece that I wrote for my university with the intention of it becoming like the alma mater for the university. So that premiered as well. So in the time where I was feeling, I was feeling really down before that happened because it was right before finals week. I'm sitting in my office at the church where I work at um, just spending seven hours a day, four to five days a week, just doing homework by myself. Yeah. And then the opportunity of using Zoom, of having our phones 
and stuff that that's able to connect us. Um, because, you know, before this, I was like, you know, cell phones are the root of all evil and we should all dump them in the fire before the FBI hears everything that we do. But could you imagine oh my quarantine goodness. without you, phones? Could you imagine? It's insane. So, I mean, I'm just overwhelmed and thankful. I mean, right now, as we're recording this, restrictions have been lightened a little bit, but we're still in quarantine. Yeah. We're still yeah. in quarantine right now, even though we are half a nation um, apart. So, well, like, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so what is, like, what what has changed in your life? What have you uh, started doing? Has this allowed for you to, like, take time and reflect? Have you been depressed? Have you been, like, wh what is your day-to-day -day and how has it changed? Um, so... <laughs> So I grew up in a military family. My parents um, instilled in me that you do not really sleep in. You really don't. Um, so sleeping in for me, honestly, if I am in bed past like nine o'clock, I feel like I've wasted the day and I wait for like my dad to come into my room. It's like, get up, you're wasting half the day, you know? Yeah. Um, so as much as I try to sleep in, I really can't. Um, before school got out, um, I was able to go to my office and I did homework and stuff in there from like nine to four. And then I had lazy time just cause I didn't want my life to be chaotic. I didn't want to like, Oh, Hey, it's 10 o'clock. I guess I'll work on this assignment. That's due at 1 PM today, I guess, you know, I wanted to structure things out. And I had this intention of being like, yes, I'm going to get a routine. I'm going to start working out for, I was training for a half marathon before. Yes, uh, you were. I, I was. totally remember that. forgot. Oh my remember, God. You remember my Snapchats or text messages yeah. at like 5 a.m. where I'm like, yes, <laughs> I am fit. I am ready to go. Mm. And then one of the motivating factors of getting on my bed was going to super one and getting a pack of donuts to get me through the morning. So there's a trade off, you know, we have to deal with what we got. You got to get your six pack some way. You, know? you got to get my six pack somewhere. And it's a six pack or is a six pack of donuts from freshly baked and super one. Uh, <laughs> what about you? What's keeping you busy? Um, oh my gosh. I feel like the first, you know, couple of weeks it, it was, I didn't do a lot of anything, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like really only recently, I, I've been working on my music, I've been writing, I've been uh, working on getting it produced and you know, going back and forth, recording different things. Uh, I've kind of more recently been stacking a lot, um, mm. taking dance classes, doing workouts, doing different challenges. Um, I'm went keto again so that's you know something to occupy the time i guess because i have all the time to cook my own food so why not <laughs> right. i uh i'm gonna be a part of a, a live stream show i i'm you know i what else am i doing oh my god i'm writing a musical we're doing a podcast we're doing a, i was about to say you're missing something very important and like that's really interesting because um i've i've noticed that there's like been like three types of people that have come out of this. You have like the types like me who are like, okay, I still want to keep a schedule. I still want to do this, 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 this. We have people like uh, people like you who are like stacking, who are like putting a lot of projects on their plate. So you're always doing something. And then you have the third type of person who probably hasn't gotten out of their bed since the middle of February, you know, who are just kind of bumming around and stuff. And it's interesting you say that because I feel like I've had all three of those people. It's it's all been cycles. <laughs> That's all you. And I think we all like experience at least one shade of that. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Like it, in the beginning, um, I was really like I was going through it. I became pretty depressed mm -hmm. and not a lot of motivation, was not happy, was sleeping. And, you know, I feel like in a backwards way, I kind of needed it. I needed mm. quarantine 
to reevaluate my life, take a step back, breathe, and mm -hmm. just get this cycle of emotion that I had pent up for so long being in being in New York City and and feeling lost as an actress and all these mm -hmm. things getting it out. I feel like I needed that. And then slowly I started to rebuild, started to get a schedule, realized that, you know, hey, doing a dance class makes me feel really good online. And from mm -hmm. there, I've just, you know, so I feel like right now I'm in a really good place and I would mm -hmm. not have been able to take on as many projects as I am had they not, A, brought me joy and mm -hmm. B, if I was in the same place I was, you know, mm -hmm. eight weeks ago. Right. And you learn to appreciate all these little things because a lot of at least motivation for me these days is like, how can I maximize my happiness? Yeah. How can I, in the absence of so many things I'm used to doing, me waking up at six, you know, getting ready, going to the gym, um, going to school, ending the day with choir having dinner um, with some friends and then going to bed and doing this cycle over and over again. So like going, now we have a chance to cook more. We have a chance to go outside. But the big question that I have is what about the performing arts as a whole? Like, I think we have our lives pretty figured out. It's like a put together mess right now because I don't think anyone can be fully put together right now. Yeah. But like for the performing arts and especially for you as a theater person, like what does that scene look like right now? So Broadway is a very expensive business. Ooh, I, we're going to talk about money and I think it's going to make me sad a little bit. Why? Because we have none? Yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> um, the average operating cost for a play, $300,000 per week. A musical, $590,000. And this is average. You you uh, take shows like SpongeBob or Beetlejuice, that's going to be way more expensive. That production value is... Oh, yeah. You know. What's going to be more expensive? Our town, the minimalist, or is it going to be right. SpongeBob where there's fireworks. I don't know. I've never seen SpongeBob. Right, right, right. So, you know, producers and people who are operating the theaters um, were becoming aware of this, kind of, you know, but they were still trying to desperately bring in the cash flow. You know, some, mm -hmm. uh, some closed before others. Some, uh, you know, like we got the Moulin Rouge before the official announcement. Mm -hmm. Um some like that week it was very strange you could get tickets for like 50 bucks i think we went and saw to kill a mockingbird for 50 dollars. wow yeah um with ed harris so oh, wonderful yeah. that's yeah. awesome what? yeah uh dollars. but broadway is a week-to-week -week business you know and mm -hmm. not only is broadway week week to week business, but the hotels and restaurants that surround them are also relying on those theaters to bring in the people and to make the re revenue so that they also have cu customers and re revenue themselves. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, Hi nice to see you. <laughs> hello. Welcome to the English language, Callie. You guys are going to discover that I am very, like, not really <laughs> adequate. Adequate? <laughs> adequate? A Atticus Finch. Atticus Finch. <laughs> We're tying it in. Easter egg. Sometimes we make up words on this podcast, and it's okay. We go with it. Very true. Very true. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but Broadway is expected to burn over one hundred million dollars in losses. Oh my gosh! Like, and how far is that projected to? Is it like just right now from? March to right now? Uh, from the articles that I read, it, those were posted in like April, April and May. Um, and I think they were projecting to like mid-June, so right about where we are at. But I mean, still. And that's like the first wave, you know what I mean? Yeah. So who knows? And it's also cost 
over 87,000 jobs, you know? Yeah. Broadway and theater take up 20% of the live performing arts. So you just you think about every everyone, the actors, the producers, the costume people, the hair people, like the makeup, the tech, the sound, the lighting, mm-hmm. the directors, the choreographer, the, the list like seemingly endless mm-hmm. for the amount of people that it takes to put on one show. There's 41 theaters on the Great White Way. And not not to mention just that, but you know, all the off-Broadway theaters and all the regional theaters and all the mm. and college theaters. I mean, everyone, if, you, right. if it's, if it has been paid, you're, you're out a job. Oh my gosh. So unfortunately a lot oh. of shows had to actually be closed and some before they even ever opened because oh, of the really? funding. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see, there were four shows that got, that had to close. Due mm-hmm. to the coronavirus, and that were Hangmen. Uh, that Hangmen was in previews when the, when it, uh, we closed, and they expected a March nineteenth opening. And remember, we we closed on the twelfth. Oh, jeez! So a yeah. week, just, literally just a week, a week away. Um, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? It was just in their ninth preview. They were expected to open April 9th. Um. Beetlejuice, uh, except Beetlejuice's, you know, Beetlejuice was expected to be evicted from the Winter Garden Theater so mm-hmm. that the Music Man could come in uh, on June 6th. But even just knowing that it's like you said, like going through that, going through that show and finding out the next day that you're out of the business, you're out of job, not mm-hmm. knowing that that was going to be your last show. Yeah, how I mean, how horrible. Um, and the only long-running show that had to be canceled, and this is huge, was Disney's Frozen. Yeah, that one surprised me. That one really surprised me. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, it's just it's it's crazy. A, the amount of funding that it takes to do shows like this, and B, just how crazy this whole thing. And then we had what is this? One, two, three, six shows that had to be postponed. Um, so these were new shows that were being in development. Flying Over Sunset, um, they were going to start previews on March 12th. They were they were literally going to start uh, on the day that it, yeah. Um, Birthday Candles, Carolina Under Change, How I Learned to Drive, Plaza Suite, and MJ, uh, which is a musical about Michael Jackson. Uh, they all had to be postponed. Some are postponing to the fall. Some are postponing to 2021. You know, some aren't even mm-hmm. taking the chance. Wow. Yeah. So it's it's a lot. I mean, it, it really is. And, and mm-hmm. you wonder how these companies, how these actors are managing. Because that's all, you know, it's all they know. Mm-hmm. Um, so... From the New York Times, the Broadway League uh, initially said that they were going to pay all their actors for two weeks, and then at the contract minimum for two more weeks with benefits included. By the way, I think that was extended. Um, I'm not sure. I know Mm -hmm. that a lot of it has been coming from the Actors Fund and different ways that you can donate, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the actors themselves, they've been really going towards social media um, to look for money, to look for mm-hmm. opportunities, to look for a platform to perform again. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. it'll do performing, but to perform. And one person that I found, uh, what, his name is Brett Shuford, and he has a YouTube channel where he uh, is on Broadway, but mm-hmm. he's, I mean, he's also a Broadway life coach. He has this whole business called Broadway life coach. Um, He has a whole apparel line called Broadway life apparel. He's also half of a, a a YouTube channel called the Broadway husbands. Um, And just, you know, really taking this opportunity and just desperately trying to get business and, and, and any means necessary to, 
to try and help them. Um, mm -hmm. So he, I know he has an apparel line up on his broadwaylifeapparel.com um, mm -hmm. for COVID and all the net proceeds are going to relief funds. Uh, mm -hmm. I also found a hat on there that Ooh. says finishing the referencing oh. <laughs> Sondheim. <laughs> And I so think I, about I, that show and I cry. I know. It's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so if you'd like to help, you can uh, go to that website and pick up some merch, you know, help out Brett as an actor and also help out uh, mm -hmm. people affected by COVID. There's a lot of online events going on. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know about you, but my feed has been like, wow, like there's too much. There's I'm doing this. Much. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. And I'm like, oh, okay, I gotta, 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 gotta put that on my calendar. All, all of these live streams. I mean, it's mm -hmm. too much. It's too much, but it, it's, you know, it's necessary. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this. George Salazar uh, oh, has yeah. a YouTube. Uh, he put up a, he started making a YouTube thing called Sundays on the Couch with George. Uh, where he just talks to people and talks about life and just kind of oh. is like this cozy little coping, just say, hey, how are you doing? And it's so cute. Mm. Uh, oh, Laura yeah. Benanti uh, has created Sunshine Songs. And that is where kids in high school and, you know, college whose shows got canceled, they can send her the songs that they were going to perform. What? Uh, yes. And she watches every single one of them. And, you know, it, it, she's... How special. Yeah. I mean, it's it's so amazing. People need that. These kids, they need oh that. Um, I mean, and then there's, um, there's tons of things on YouTube. Playbill, the National Theater. Uh, Rob Miles does Zoom Shakespeare, full-length Shakespeare plays. Um, the Royal Opera House uh, do, is doing their hashtag from our house to your house. Uh, and they're putting their live, their full performances on. Um, mm -hmm. Arizona Broadway Theater, After Dark Cabarets. They're doing Zoom cabarets, I think, every week. Uh, Stars in the House with Seth, Seth Rudetsky and James Wesley. They have a show every single day on YouTube. It's if you don't, crazy. And they get this variety of different people on. I don't know how they do it. They do two shows. They, they do two shows every single day, one at 2 p.m. and one at 7 p.m., I believe. Um, and it's it's insane. They are angels for doing it every every right. single day. And it's they do it every day, and it takes us two weeks to plan an episode of a podcast. So it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but so far, um, this is the latest numbers I've heard. I'm sure this is a little bit more by now, but uh, they've so far, all of their um, episodes are to help the Actors Fund. That's that's what they plug, that they mm -hmm. want people to donate, donate, donate. And they've raised uh, over $300,000 so far. Wow. Yep. Um, Broadway Cares, uh, Equity Fights AIDS has donations and YouTube events as well. And then there was that uh, one-time event live with Rosie, Rosie O'Donnell. Do you remember mm. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and she raised... Uh, half a million dollars for the oh, Actors Fund. Wow. Yeah. Rosie, let's go. Yeah. Um. You know, Brian Stokes Mitchell, the chairman of the Actors Fund, has been very vocal. Very. I mean, mm -hmm. he's he's a teddy bear. We all love him. We we all love him. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, there's just so much. You know, mm -hmm. there's so much, but it seems to be almost therapeutic for audience members mm -hmm. for theater enthusiasts, for the actors themselves, for mm -hmm. just a platform to express and to be together and to come together. And once again, arts is bringing us all together. Yes. Um, and no, nothing will, nothing will ever compare to the experience and the feeling of live theater. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for now it's, 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 it's kind of what, people need so if you need any comfort yeah. if you need a daily comfort my god check out seth rudetsky if you have not already stars yeah. in the house i just Bear watched Angels. his uh falsetto land um reunion yeah and yeah. i'm just like oh it was just so so good and uh just stuff like that you know he's had danny devito on um 
it's it's just crazy. It's, there's such a variety and so much fun. And all of these um, Broadway artists are doing incredible things um, because they just care so much and they are adamant about keeping not only the art form alive, but the people who create the art form sustain. And I just think it's beautiful how it's bringing us together, even when we're apart. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the biggest questions that we're facing now is, okay, we have all these opportunities. Great. How does it come back though? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we can't ever come back to normal, right? We, there's no way. Even if we can get everybody in the seats and actors on stage performing, there's so many other things that cannot be normal again. Right. And so there's been talk about, you know, quarantining casts together for two weeks. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. And even in uh, film, they made a movie. I forget what the film is called, but they, they filmed a movie where they quarantined the whole cast. Um oh. And they set them up in hotels and everything. But even then, one of, I think it was like a, a stagehand or like a producer, not a producer, but like, you know, someone, someone on the crew just left his hotel room to like buy a new tube of toothpaste, got coronavirus, and then had to be quarantined and had to do contact tracing. All so it's so... Oh tricky. God. It's so tricky. Uh -huh. Um, and and Broadway cannot afford to do social distancing in its theaters. Right. Have asking people to sit, you know, every other seat, every two seats. Well, then you'd have also have to see every other row. And right. That you know, you cannot sustain when you're a business that runs on ticket sales. You cannot sustain. No, a, a, you know, a quarter to a third of your capacity. Um, although uh, the Barrington Stage Company in Massachusetts has offered another model. Mm -hmm. It's reducing its 520 seat main theater to one third, increasing the distance between the rows and cleaning up after every show. Mm -hmm. uh, audiences will be required to wear masks. Additional entrances and exits are also being built. And there will be no intermissions for the performances. Oh wow! Yeah. Um, so that's that's that that is interesting. Mm -hmm. That that'll be different, you know. Yeah. Um, outdoor theater, outdoor theater is going to have a spike. Man. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Big Apple Circus here in New York City. They're talking about doing setting up little tents. And like having like an interactive, like only two people can be in a tent at a time or whatever, but like you're in mm. the circus, you know, um, you know, Cuomo has his four week plan starting mm. on Ju June 8th and it'll be two week increments of how we're going to reopen Broadway's on that very last leg of it. Um, uh, so there's potential that it could be pushed back. Right, depending on how the other oh, how the wow. other ones open up as well. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I think we'll definitely like the Massachusetts theater, see more independent, smaller regional theaters start to open up before Broadway does. Mm -hmm. You know, because they are able, they're having less people gather anyway, mm -hmm. and they are able to kind of, you know, manage that how they can. Mm -hmm. So it's it's going to be a a long while before yeah. we see Broadway fully come back in bloom. It brought up a really interesting point, and that mm -hmm. is how we can make Broadway theaters and theaters in general contactless uh, with tickets, with playbills, with uh, merchandise, mm. um, you know, and kind of the controversy on that. I mean, you, you get an iconic playbill many many i have people. all of my playbills up in exactly. my room you, you know? exactly many it's people collect them and and the you know the experience of waiting at a stage door to get your autograph from your favorite artist mm -hmm. um you know what does that mean does that mean that there's online versions of the playbills and 
-hmm. people just bring an iPad or something to get signed or, or are they, you know, is that even too much contact, you know? Yeah. Are we even going to have signings and, and stage dooring? I have all these memories I have from these playbills. Like I look at them and I'm transported to not only the show itself, but the experience leading up to that show. And that's a loss. It's like these necessary losses. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and when I start talking about choir stuff here, um, I can go into why it's still like really dangerous to have even people in the theater, no yeah. matter about capacity. But a lot of these are necessary sacrifices, but gosh, it's going to stink. It's going to stink real hard. But is it something that we should be doing all along, this contactless, paperless? I mean, on a strictly environmental level, I, yeah. I, is, this, is this, you know, paving the way for a new revolution of how we view theater and how we go to theater and, and you know, idolize? What if, what if we have the merch up at, at, in display, but mm. instead of, you know, doing it, we just order it on on the website or on the scan code that they have, mm -hmm. and then it ships to our apartment. Well, like think about like this, and this is so interesting to think about. Like people have been saying since the advent of smartphones, like years from now, we will be doing stuff like this. We won't yeah. have to leave our homes to have classes, have performance, all of these things, but it was taken away, taken away from us. It was taken away. And there are so many things with the absence of humans that were like, okay, this is kind of a positive, like carbon emissions and stuff. Yes. Stuff with the environment. Like, okay, now we can see these active effects of global warming that are true because the absence of humans have made these noticeable changes. Um, yes. And I think it kind of speaks to the fragility of tradition. Like awesome. if, if you can like playbills and stuff, why do we like playbills so much? Why do we like programs? It's something tangible. Yeah. It's something we hold in our hands and we look at it and we made, makes us think about it versus having it on our phone. This, even though everything's becoming technological, the idea of having paper of like good old times, you know, it's like reading the newspaper. I'm not saying that paper programs and stuff are a thing of the past, but eventually all of your new stuff now gets emailed to you in the morning. Yeah, exactly. And it, you know, and there, there's that conversation because people mourn over the decrease in sales of newspapers people mourn the amount of screen time that their children have versus playing outside but that's just that reality that they live in now yeah and we have to mourn for progress and i'm not saying that i don't want a playbill i love my playbills so much i have a signed copy of a gentleman's guide to love and murder up in my room right now that i pass by every day and I, and I love it. And it's just so many good memories. Yeah. But these, the fragility of tradition that we do it just because we've done it, that's not fair necessarily if there is a better alternative that we can get over in 10 years. Absolutely. And, and I think we are going to see a trend, um, not only in, in, coping and managing with that, but also the shows themselves. Um, yes. They will be smaller casts. Mm -hmm. They will be smaller orchestras. Mm -hmm. You know, one, one man shows will be more uh, worth it, both yeah. financially and safety wise. Um, we're going to see quarantining casts and, and production teams. Um, but do you think quarantining casts and stuff like that's going to be the same forever? Do you think that's going to be it forever or do you think that's just going to be a reality for like the next year or so? Uh, I would like to say that there's an end to it. Um, you know, I don't think, I, I think until we get a vaccine and everyone can get a vaccine and then you'd be required to yeah. get it before you could be cast in something or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but that also means less, uh, less, 
technical and less uh, complicated sets mm -hmm. that are expensive and take a lot of people to run. You know, we're going to see a lot of a decade for this stuff to come back. Like think yeah. about, you, you know, what you were saying, like not since the uh, 1700s, 1800s, all this stuff. Yeah. It hasn't been close. So it's been building up to this. It's been building up to frozen the musical. It's like yeah. opera and Wagner, you know, we, and you we know go towards Wagner and then we go away, right? And you know what's tragic about the situation is that last year was like their highest grossing sales <sighs> in, in theater in like a long time. The mm -hmm. past five years have kind of started to become a golden age of like, you know, more people are seeing theater and theater is mm -hmm. getting closed out and ticket prices can start going up and, and all this mm -hmm. stuff because they were so good and sustained. And then now it's nothing, you know? Yeah. Um, and one more thing I wanted to kind of put in here. I found it very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a Vanity Fair interview with a producer who just left, left them as anonymous. Mm -hmm. And basically talking about their opinions on the exposure of how broken the Broadway system is as a business. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is a quote from them. What I would hope is that all the different powers that be, the theater owners, commercial producers, nonprofits, and the unions which we all negotiate, everyone has to see this as an opportunity to re-examine the structures that currently exist that make producing a show so expensive in the first place. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping as we I'm hoping as we're figuring it out and mourning and stressing that this can be used as a way to evaluate the way that inequality is built into the structure of our business itself to come back and by necessity have a better business model we are not going to be able to go back to normal mm. and I, I you know it, it is it's 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 exposing a very broken expensive mm -hmm. very you know non it, unequal system unfair mm. system it's it's you know i really hope that the people that have power in making our careers possible mm -hmm. are deconstructing the system yeah, and making it new and better and more accessible and more widespread and just equal, you know? Yeah, totally. So there are a lot of actors who are being really affected by this thing you know especially if you're equity you lost all your benefits and everything so what you can do if you can give anything anything at all uh you can give your donations directly to the actors fund through the actorsfund.org through broadway cares equity fights aids um and there is a specific website that i'd like to talk about today called i lost my theater gigs this is a space where people who have had jobs in the theater affected by covid can write their own testimonies and you can look at their own personal stories and you can specifically donate to whoever you want and need. This is all independent. It's, it's, you know, it's, these are vulnerable artists. These are artists who aren't necessarily equity. They are in smaller theaters in community theaters where that was their job. So you can help them out. I lost my theater gigs dot squarespace dot com. This much like Callie's research um, is pretty humbling. When, you, when you're looking at this. Um, so first I wanna start out from a news story and um, a lot of this information from this news story I got from livescience.com and cdc.gov about like the ground zero for why COVID-19 and choirs do not mix. <laughs> so it, it, I mean, it, it just doesn't mix. Um, so this takes place in Mount Vernon, Washington um, at a choir practice in on March 10th, right? So this was about two weeks before the governor shut down the state because Washington was the hot spot in the United States when um, it first came around. So the choir knew about um, the risks with the virus and stuff. And the director was like, if you have any symptoms at all, do not come. 
all right? And they wanted to initiate social distancing um, and no physical contact measures as well. So on March 2nd in Mount Vernon, there were only two confirmed corona cases. But in Seattle's uh, King's Country, there is 270. Mm. So uh, I got that figure from the Washington State Department of Health. So let, let me repeat that. In Mount Vernon, on that day, March 10th, there were only two confirmed cases, all right? So a lot of the choir didn't want to risk it. This is, it was a pretty big choir. It's a choir of 120 some people. Oh my God. Yeah, right? I want to be a choir that big again. Like what the heck, I miss it. Um, but so a lot of them, half of them elected not to come. So 61 singers showed up and the rehearsal lasted about two and a half hours. So they sang together for a total of 85 minutes. They did sectionals for 50 minutes and somewhere in the middle, they had like a 15 minute break where they had like snacks and had breaks and talking with each other. Um, as we know, people who are older and people who have underlying medical conditions are extremely at risk. Um, the demographics, uh, most of the choir was full of older women with the average age of being about 69 years old. Of the 61 members there, 52 of them ended up getting COVID-19. Ah. <laughs> 52 of them, okay? Wow. Three of those people were hospitalized, and of those three, two of them died. Oh, my God. So, like, the main problem is, you know, they social distance, right? They did. They didn't initiate, uh, they had, I, some of them might have had face masks on, I'm not 100% sure, but there definitely wasn't any contact. But you think of things like sharing that food, right? Passing it to one another. Um, chairs, you know? Yeah. Moving chairs on doorknobs and stuff. So then the question is, could this have been prevented? There are respiratory droplets and there are aerosol droplets okay so your respiratory droplets they don't travel far and they are not considered to be airborne so i think it's like the droplets and stuff like when you touch your face or something or touch your mouth touch your nose and then you touch surfaces and stuff mm -hmm. i believe that that's what it's from but then the one that we are concerned about the big thing with social distancing are these aerosol droplets now, these droplets are small enough where they can travel long distances, and they are the cause of airborne infections. So when you think about, like, the mecha mechanism of, like, what it is to be, like, a good singer, it's all based around um, tone and vowel shape. And so when we strive for these, like, really good vowels, you have to think that that means it's completely open and there is no obstruction. It's just going all the way through. And it's traveling pretty far because you're singing at elevated volumes, right? Man, that thing is like a power washer. It's it like is. A, it's like a megaphone. Yeah. It's like a fire hydrant just spitting out coronavirus on you. And, and then you have to think of like our plosive consonants like P's and B's. And it creates these puffs of smoke. And, you know, when you're singing, right? You have to amplify those so the audience can understand what you're saying. So another thing here is like your vocal tract, it goes like from your lips all the way to your lungs. And it's covered in this nice mucosal lining. Oh. And so I know, right? Awesome. It moisturizes everything and it ends up trapping foreign bodies, right? So as we breathe, and as we inhale, everything expands. And so we're intaking all of these foreign bodies, okay? And then when we exhale, everything contracts and then everything comes out. So then we put that back out into the world. And again, that is amplified from the different types of breathing versus when you breathe up here when you're talking versus when you're bringing, uh, singing deep down into your lungs for, um, singing. It's crazy. So when you're breathing out, these drops, um, they form like a column, like 
one researcher said it was kind of like its own little weather system that happens. Oh, weird. Isn't that weird? Yeah. And then it kind of goes away, all these drops, and then you're left with these aerosol ones that travel these far distances, which, if you're infected, will contain the virus. If it interacts with air vents or audience members with warm air, it can spread the virus around. So if you're in a room with poor circulation, or if you're in a small room with a bunch of people, or if you're in a small room with bad circulation and a bunch of people, that is literally a hot spot. So when you look at why this choir in Washington had so many people infected, which 87% of the people got infected, 87%, is because you are put in this situation where everything is amplified. You're with about 61 people. I don't know the size of the room and maybe poor air vent, air circulation in the room. It's like a hot spot. 87% versus a lot of the time in other situations without singing and same amount of people, it could only be like 25%. Hmm. Hmm. When you're social distancing and everything, 25%. When you're singing in this situation, got bumped up to 87%. Wow. 87%. It's crazy. Um. It's Let's really interesting that you say that about the warm air. Because yeah. wasn't it said that with summer or like just warm weather in general that mm -hmm. you're going to see a decrease? I think that has to do with like more of like, a, and I can't speak for certain. I'm not a scientist. Remember, amateur expertise. You know, we did this research in a couple days, right? Right. Um, I think it has to do with like the maybe not humidity of it, but like warm, wet air, like natural. And like in the summer, maybe it's a more dry heat, so it doesn't thrive as much. Yeah. So when you think of like you're in a room and it's hot and it's stuffy and then your windows start to fog up, condensation happens there. Mm -hmm. And then when you open up the window, that condensation goes away because there's this airflow that's coming in. You, mm. you see you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, so like you said, with like um, performing outside, stuff like this has been brought around like a lot. But the big thing about it, you know, you social distance and everything, um, you have to be mindful of the wind direction. Like imagine you have everybody standing yeah, right. in a line and no one's like, because it's like a megaphone. It goes out like this. So if you're having people social distance to your side, you're not going to affect them. But if that wind suddenly starts coming this way, right at you, <laughs> then you have all of these people that you could potentially infect with these little aerosol droplets. Wouldn't and, that when you, and when you inhale for your next breath, it's going in, gets trapped in there, and then you exhale it again. Wouldn't that be a sight to see is like an outdoor choir or an outdoor like theater. And like every time the wind changed, like people had to like shift their body. <laughs> like instead we of would be the, paranoid. Let's have someone like conducting um, with the baton. They have like a weather flag. And so the weather flag dictates, dictates on how the choir is standing or which way they're singing. Um, I would hate that for one. Um so when you think about like minimizing risk when you're inside, so rehearsing outside, that's at a lower risk, right? You just have to be very, very mindful of wind changes. Very, mm. very mindful. Um, the question is supposed like, okay, how do we make it safer to be inside and stuff? Like how can we get a routine inside? Well, getting some upper like UV lights, and with a combination of ceiling fans and like good air circulation in the room, like that could do a lot to sterilize the virus. Um, and that would prevent some risk. So like the big question, mm -hmm. when is it, like you were saying, when is it safe to come back? When can we be in a room with 120 people and sing just fine in our small little rehearsal space that doesn't have any windows or whatever, right? 
obviously not the most positive thing, but we have to have a vaccine. We have to have a number vaccine. One, number or, one. Number one thing. Or we have to have a treatment that is 95% effective. This is deadlier than the flu, folks. Like, we need to make sure that we are being mindful of vaccines and believing our healthcare professionals um, and our health organizations. Um, because masks and social distancing obviously does not do the trick when you're singing. It really doesn't. In other normal situations, when you're talking at a regular volume or whatever, it's better. But when you're singing amplified, these aerosol droplets are just going to be projected and there's nothing that's going to stop them. Um, and obviously you can risk rehearsing outside. I know there are a lot of people who are for that idea, but you know, it's like you literally have to have your weather app open like all the time to make sure that that happens. Um, this thing could affect performances for the next one to two years. And so when things are slowly, and I'm talking slowly, start to reopen, there was this questionnaire posed by um, two doctors named Claudia Spann and Bernard Richter. And they thought of three different um, safety protocol precautions as organizations and choirs consider opening up again. So the first thing is intake control. So you do a symptom questionnaire. You're able to do contact tracing and you have the ability to do body temperature checks. Mm -hmm. And so that consists like having that communication with your choir and probably having to sign waivers as well that say, unless there's a vaccine, everything's very high risk. The second thing they talk about is in-room parameters. So you either make music outdoors and being mindful of wind direction, or you use a sufficiently large room. I mean, like a big room, like a church, a concert hall, anything like that. And in that room, you have to maintain good ventilation, but natural ventilation is recommended. Windows, doors, just getting outside air in and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And also the thing that kind of surprised me the most was rehearse in short chunks, like 15 minutes, and then you take breaks in between. So I'm assuming that's for the fact that you don't want things, too much of those aerosol droplets to populate at one time, and it gives the air vents and natural air circulation to disperse and sterilize the room. Did you uh, say how long it lasts in the air for? Because I've heard like three hours. Like I, I'm not even sure yeah, about that. I, I didn't necessarily find that, but I know it. These short 15 minute chunks mm -hmm. um, are essential to make sure that it just doesn't populate. Like this forming a cloud and these things that stay in the air for a long time. People have said that anywhere from three minutes to three hours if it gets in contact with the surface, like um, those other droplets yeah. as well. Okay. It, it's crazy. And then the third thing is individual protective measures. Even though masks um, are not the end all be all for prevention, they are still essential. They are still essential you're wearing a mask outside the rehearsal space, you're wearing a mask inside the rehearsal space, right? And you still yeah. maintain adequate social distancing. So about six and a half feet apart. And by the way, yes. in smaller towns like our hometown, I've, you know, if people don't take it as seriously because they don't see it and they don't get it and that's whatever. Mm -hmm. But, you know, wearing a mask also includes social dis social distancing you know if you mm -hmm. are already social distancing you still need to wear a mask yes if you are walking down the sidewalk and there is another person and you're like oh crap i got a social distance and you even if you walk to the other side of the street you should still be wearing a mask because mm -hmm. of these particles because of these mm -hmm. things you have no idea if someone coughed if someone mm -hmm. was like having a conversation out on their like driveway I mean, you never know what's in mm -hmm. the air yes and because 
people it's not a tangible thing for us as human beings we can't see these aerosol droplets in there we can't see these corona filled uh pieces of mucus and everything in the air so it's really hard for people to understand but it it's essential it, it really really is so like <laughs> with like okay so here's our 20 step process on getting able to rehearse again what, what are we doing in the meantime right so a lot of this information came from where does it come from a lot of this information has come from webinars um where these choral professionals are talking about their own experiences and their own concerns but they're not just talking amongst themselves they're also bringing in these um health professionals these doctors mm. So okay. they can make informed decisions. I remember when that um, ACDA webinar came out and it had all these things that I um, just read off. And I don't know, it made me, it made me very, very sad for the reality, but I was also confident because they brought in healthcare professionals and people who knew what they were talking about. Yeah. Um, and people are doing like a lot of cool online projects um kind of the big one that's kind of like the no duh sort of thing it's like virtual choirs like everyone's doing virtual choirs right now and there are so many different ways that people are doing it and a lot of these things that they're producing is so very very special mm -hmm. so very very special um i especially think for these like high schoolers and i think about these high school seniors um, you know, they put on their headphones, they listen to a backing track, or they watch their conductor conduct, and then they sing, and it's very isolating. Um, but then they put all the director or editor puts that all together and makes this really, really special um, virtual choir. I remember a few weeks ago, the work, the youth choir that I work with, we did like a little virtual choir thing. Um, one of the other interns I work with, she spent um, so much time putting it all together um, with sound and then video. And mm -hmm. I remember I was crying like a baby. Like every time I cried, I watched it so many times. Um, and then this video we had, we didn't just have the kids looking and singing, you know, at the camera for five and a half minutes. Um, we spliced in uh, videos of them playing outside because we live in a beautiful area um over here with them playing outside and writing about why they love singing why they loved um um playing outside and that and that's another thing like you can if you're working with like youth choirs or choirs in school um how do you increase engagement and then you have to figure out what is the goal of my yeah. choir is my mission statement I'm going to have our mission here at the blah, blah, blah course is to have the best choir in the universe. The end. No, because a parent isn't going to want to send their kid into choir boot camp, you know? Right. So many educational choral experiences care about the holistic child. They care about every aspect of the child and the belief that singing in choirs aid in the growth of the child not just musically but every aspect of that person and then there's these great other education resources so like things like harmony helper that help kids with sight reading and um, there's just so many mm -hmm. resources like that out there that you can still supplement your students musical experience even when you're not singing in a choir because you know you, you think of scaffolding, you think of, okay, how do we get our students from here to here, you know, from here to here? It's not by brute force. You don't just throw them up there and like, okay, now sing this uh, Bach cantata, f fifth grader, you know, have fun. Yeah. You know, what are the steps to get there? And so people who think that they think that they don't have time during a rehearsal to do sight reading and stuff, well, okay, here you go. Students, here's your assignment for this week. Along with learning your part, you also have to do X amount of time of sight reading on this website. And so when the day comes when we finally get to sing together, these kids, while maybe not having quote unquote practical experience singing in that choir, they have garnered all these amazing um, skills with music theory, uh, with ear training, with sight singing, 
all these great things. Um, yeah. And it, it, it's, what do you, so what do you think about all of like well, those online resources and events that are happening? I, I just kind of barfed all of that out because I think it's no. so exciting. No, it's fascinating. Um, hey, uh, the hilarity of Zoom, you know, the delay, I mean. We, we tried that one time and I remember it was my, I think it was my first or second um, Zoom rehearsal. We were working on, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Carmina Barana, mm -hmm. the, oh, Fortuna. Um, <laughs> and we were rehearsing and stuff and the director just kind of stops and looks at us and he's like, what would happen if we just all unmuted and started singing at the same, you know, and we tried it. You know, so he put, it, he put up his hands and he played the piano, done. Oh, 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 <laughs> because just that loud, you just can't do it. You yeah. just can't do it. And editing a virtual choir is hard. So many directors are becoming editors now. It's amazing. They are. And like, think like there's so many bad things, um, so many sad things that we're losing in um, this time. But all these skills that we're gaining, um, editing software, sound editing, video editing, communication via um, the screens, internet, all these different things that we're all having to become proficient at um, only aids us, I think, when we finally get back to normalcy, whatever that means. God, choir's gotta be such a hard thing because like you mentioned, it's such an oral experience. Being a choir director, you're listening for how it sounds and technique. Mm -hmm. And you there's it's virtually impossible to to know how to do that mm -hmm. through, through an online platform. Right. Cause the choir director's job is listen, give direction, and then have them sing again, right? Mm -hmm. So it's this constant stream and we thrive on instant feedback we thrive on the idea of okay we can do this instantly and then we get excited i know when i rehearse and stuff i end up getting sweaty i end up getting so sweaty because i jump around the room i'm doing this i'm doing that or whatever it's a workout but now i'm relegated to my chair my piano in front of me and all right i, I can't hear you sing right now but I think it's good. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> when the internet cuts out. I think it, 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 measure five and go. Uh. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, and, and and like you said, like actual singing is 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 gonna take a long time, and you, you that also goes into play with live music, like contemporary music. Mm -hmm. um, you know, frontmen of a band. And how that's, you know, all like all these music festivals and, and concerts from musicians that just can't happen anymore. Fortunately, uh, musicians in orchestras, they'll probably be able to come back sooner than band and choir yeah. and, and contemporary music. Also for audience engagement, right? So for the audience safety, you can't... Um, be singing at them in person. So there's some great things. So um, a thing that um, the youth choir uh, did was anywhere seat. It's where you purchase an online ticket or you make a, a goodwill donation and then you get this access code. And then the day and time of that concert, you submit that access code and then you're able to watch um, the video. Um, you can also do something, I think it's called Feel It Live, where it's the same thing, um, but you can also do like a live performance or pre-recorded performance and stuff. So there are, there's so many ways to keep the choir people, the choir members engaged, and more than enough things to keep the choir director mulling over and thinking about. I also found Live Nation and mm. uh, stage it to St online yeah. to online resources where you can buy tickets uh, to contemporary music artists. Um, Live Nation is more of a resource center uh, mm -hmm. where they will put up if someone's doing uh, an Instagram live or a YouTube stream or a Facebook stream or anything. So you can mm -hmm. use that as a resource center to see your favorite artists. 
All right, we're going to uh, take a little commercial break here. And up next, I want to talk about something that we're both affected by. So stick around. On May 25th, 2020, George Floyd, a black man, was brutally murdered by a police officer while three other officers stood there and watched. We at Broken Art Podcast believe that we have a duty as content creators to build awareness and amplify the voices of black, indigenous, and people of color in our community. We ask that you please take time now or at the end of this episode to donate to the websites and causes in the description. Silence is violence and is past due for action. All right, everybody. Uh, I want to talk to you about auditions. This is something that directs, affects us both directly. Um, mm -hmm. I've been doing auditions. Uh, you've been doing auditions. You've been conducting auditions yourself. Yep. Um, played for a lot of auditions. So how COVID has changed the realm of auditions has been uh, you have to do self-tapes. You have to do everything online mm -hmm. now. Um. So I just I, I just wanted to push put this in here really quick, uh, just mm -hmm. to kind of talk about it and see if like the contact list, uh, playbills and tickets and everything, if this is also something that will revolutionize how we move on in the future. Mm -hmm. That's I mean you think about it, yeah. people send in their self tapes. They can mm -hmm. get it perfectly. They can have the time and and the practice that they mm -hmm. need to get that perfect take. As right. a casting director or as a, a director looking at choir auditions, mm -hmm. you know, especially in the realm of theater, you don't have to sit through a two minute audition. You can look at a video for ten seconds, and you're going to know if you want to see more from them or not. Right. Mm -hmm. So. You know, but that being said, you'll be able to see a lot more people and yes. people from all over the United States and the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, is it worth it? Is it worth these directors to be in an office instead of in the audition room? Is it is it worth seeing the more people and, and, mm -hmm. and a wide variety of people rather than the in, the in person experience mm -hmm. i guess what do you think I, I think like when when you were talking about when you posed that question i instantly went to um two things so the first thing i thought about is um performance finals for um people who are in the performing arts in um higher education mm -hmm. um so juries when you go in front of a panel of people and you perform a song that either you choose or they choose, right? And um, I had a lot of friends and colleagues who participate in juries this semester and they had to record themselves. And you know, that takes a lot of pressure off of them almost that they get to record themselves and they can have as many takes as they want. Um, but you're missing out on a lot of like, what makes performing organic right yeah. because you're very talented and very kind pianist takes time out of their day to record your accompaniment part and then sends it to you um the hard thing about that is that you really you that you're basically doing karaoke you're doing a backing track and so that's one of the main things that i would miss out on a mm -hmm. lot is an inorganic performance Mm -hmm. um, when I've um, when I've been a part of casting shows, when I've played for rehearsals and auditions, that the fact that it's different every single time, and that the idea of performing over and over and over to make it perfect, I think that also allows the casting director to be more um, nitpicky. I think there's a higher Absolutely. standard as well. So Absolutely. if I'm in this um, performance space and, um, or if I'm not in a performance space and I get this video from a student and it's them singing and if it's not really, really good, like, okay, so like a hundred points in a live performance may be different than a hundred points in a virtual performance because the scrutiny that's there. Um, and I, and I think there is a lot to be said about equality 
with virtual performances. Like you were saying, people who normally wouldn't have the resources to travel to an audition across the nation now have an opportunity to, you know, they still may not get the part, but at least this time they're not worrying about getting a $600 plane ticket and traveling halfway across the place. So I think there's a lot to be said about equality. And I think that there should be an appropriate amount of openness like Mm -hmm. something that comes to my mind is like if you're in this um mileage around um the audition then you should come in or if you're this far out you are able to excuse me you are able to send in a virtual one i know a lot of my friends who've gone to graduate school the pre-screening thing is that you send in yeah uh, you send in a video you send yeah. a video of your best self and you present yourself. And then that panel's like, we want to see more. Then you have to fly in. Maybe that's a tiered process for auditions as well. It may be a longer process, especially in a theater um, standpoint, but you know. Yeah, but that that would be able, you know, it because it that almost feels like a no brainer. You know, mm-hmm. we do, we do uh, pre-screenings for colleges, musical theater colleges, you know, Mm -hmm. why aren't we allowing the kind of floodgates to be open and you can categorize it and you can uh, section it out like equity, Mm non-equity, but you already know, you know, it doesn't take long for you to either want to see more or not want to see more. So Mm -hmm. why isn't there a pre-screening, maybe a couple pre-screenings and then have the in-person auditions where it's more, condensed mm-hmm. and more refined. The other thing to note with that is that even though it's giving artists opportunity and, and widening that stance, we also have to talk about the people who aren't fortunate enough to have internet or to have, you know, mm-hmm. correct recording software or, or yeah. just aren't tech mm-hmm. savvy. And, and, you know, maybe they're in a certain age range or maybe they just don't have the resources and, mm-hmm. And so there's still that that there's to consider. Um, mm-hmm. because-, because when when you talk about sorry to interrupt, but like yeah, with yeah. Broadway, right? It is a business. Yeah. And the sort of uh, capitalist idea um, of these resources that everyone thinks that there's only a certain amount of wealth and a certain amount of resources that can go around. And when stuff like this happens, um, Sorry to all of my um, not uh, socialist loving friends out there. Um, But these resources for things to be truly fair and equitable, because, you know, if we're saying America is a land of opportunity, then we should be giving opportunity to all of these people. And if you are running a business, if you're running a business that is dedicated to diversity, if you're running this business that's dedicated to getting everyone a seat at the table, then it is your job and obligation to spread that wealth wealth and love around. Because in this country, wealth inequality severely affects people from marginalized group and people of color. All right. Thank you so much for being on this ride with us. There's just one more segment. Um, A lot of our friends submitted um, questions to us. We took to our personal social medias and we asked them, what are some questions that you have about like the performing arts in relevance to ourselves or to um, just the world around us? And Callie has agreed to let me pick a question every week and she doesn't know what the question is this is dangerous. dangerous all right bring it on okay so the the first question of our first episode is what was the most moving piece of music you've ever heard is that your your acronym in the google doc yeah <laughs> the most... it's w-t-m-m-o-v-s-y-e-h-c-a yeah what? This thing keeps going off. I'm sorry. That's fine. We're working on it. It's, working it's episode on one. Uh, the most moving piece of music? Yes. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I have yeah. to answer that on the spot. Yeah. Well, welcome to live theater, baby. Uh, choral or theater? Doesn't matter. Any. I The first instinct was I'm here. 
from the color purple. Ah. Uh, First instinct. So good. Yeah, I, I would say I would say that I sob every time. Uh -huh. Um, what about you, sir? What is oh, your? Oh my gosh, uh, this one also was just, of course, ran right my head. Um, it was the finale of Act One from Children of Eden. Hmm. Um, the first time I cried when watching a theatrical performance was seeing that for the first time okay. and just how much, how beautiful it was and how much I love it. And it's in D flat, which is the best key out there. You can fight me on it. And Children of Eden is <laughs> Stephen Schwartz's most underrated show. And if you haven't listened to it, there's some pretty okay and really, really nice um, recordings on the YouTubes. Dot Gorgeous. Com. So it's absolutely great. So um, there's that. Callie, where can oh they find us? Wow. We made it, y'all. We did it. This if, isn't if a... You're, uh, if, you're, if you're still here, thanks for sticking around for the ride. Callie doesn't have a two and a half hour recording to break This down recording stuff. is two hours and 37 minutes. I have a lot of editing to do. Hello. That's why we give her a couple weeks to do it. That's okay. Um, so you can follow our journey and keep up with all of our posts at the Broken Art Podcast. Um, we have our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, you can also submit your questions for us to answer on the show using the hashtag BAPOD or hashtag B-A-P-O-D. It's all scrolling on the bottom if you're watching on uh, YouTube here. Um, and then you can also listen to us on the YouTube or Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Um, thank you all for listening. And as always, take your broken heart, make it into art. See you next week, guys. Thank you.